For more than a hundred years, the colony of Hong Kong had been under the administration of the British Empire, rapidly developing into a major entrepot of the region. Amidst the Second World War, tensions between the Empire of Japan and the Allied nations were escalating, as Japan was trying to make its foothold in the Pacific bigger than ever before. These tensions finally led to the Japanese Empire's simultaneous attack on Allied bases across the theatre in December of 1941. In this video, we will cover one of these attacks, the Battle of Hong Kong. Among our New Year's resolutions for 2021 is reading more books, and the sponsor of today's video Blinkist will help us achieve it despite our packed schedule. Blinkist has more than 3,000 non-fiction titles on history, science, economics, politics and much more, condensed into 15-minute listens or reads, which allows us to learn on the go and constantly improve our erudition. More than 14 million others use Blinkist actively alongside us to learn more. For fans of our channel, we recommend Ping Pong Diplomacy by Nicholas Griffin, which describes how Sino-American relationships improved due to a ping pong match. Another must-listen title is China's Second Continent by Howard French, which describes Chinese attempts to build a global empire in Africa. Now Blinkist also offers full audiobooks and premium members get up to 65% off titles. The Shortcasts is another great addition to Blinkist, popular podcasts a bridge to get you to the heart of the content ASAP. Blinkist has a great offer for our subscribers. Learn with us in 2021 by clicking the link in the description. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash Kings and Generals are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. When the British signed the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902, they were not expecting that Japan would rise to dominance in the Far East. Rather, they were concerned about the expansion of the Russian Empire in the region. But after the Russo-Japanese War and the annexation of Korea, the Empire of Japan became a powerhouse and started to dream about a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere essentially threatening the rule of Western powers in the Far East. In 1923, the Anglo-Japanese alliance was terminated, leaving behind a feeling of distrust between the British Commonwealth and the Empire of Japan. By 1936, the Japanese had expanded into Manchuria and Inner Mongolia, causing great concern in the British colonies. As Japan invaded China and managed to conquer Beijing, Nanjing and Shanghai, the colonies started preparing for war. In October 1938, Japanese troops landed at Bias Bay, just 24 kilometers northeast of Hong Kong, and captured the cities of Guangzhou and Wuhan. Despite these losses, the Chinese refused to surrender and continued to resist while building up the means to sustain the war effort. During this time, much of the aid that China received from the Allied nations arrived by sea with Hong Kong being their most important port. By 1940, around 40% of the vital supplies received by the Chinese came through Hong Kong, as most of the Chinese ports had already been occupied by Japan. Thus, for Japan's war strategy, it was critical to cut off China's supply through the British colony. Furthermore, economic sanctions and embargoes by the Allies and the United States increased tensions between the two parties, finally forcing the Japanese Empire to follow a path down to war. As the border conflicts at the Shenzhen River intensified, and thousands of refugees fled into the British colony, the Hong Kong government announced the evacuation of European women and children, and started to improve its defences for an unavoidable attack. As for its garrison, they had Major General Christopher Maltby with two British and two Indian regular army battalions, supported by one local Chinese regiment, and five infantry companies from the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps. These forces, however, lacked experienced officers and were reduced to a symbolic size, as the British government didn't think that Hong Kong could be successfully defended. Instead, it could only be held for some little time to delay the Japanese advance. In late 1941, Maltby was also reinforced by two Canadian battalions, dubbed as the Sea Force, thus helping to boost the morale of the defenders 
and bringing their total strength to 14,000 soldiers. Meanwhile, the Japanese invading force of the 23rd Army was composed of the 28th Infantry Division with approximately 20,000 men, the 2nd China Fleet with the Isuzu Light Cruiser as its flagship, and the 1st Air Brigade, mainly composed of the Kawasaki Ki-32 Light Bombers. The leading commanders of this operation, General Sakai Takeshi and Major General Karibayashi Tadamichi, planned to capture Hong Kong within 10 days by conducting a naval blockade and bombardment, along with a series of airstrikes on key installations, with a final three-pronged land invasion led by the 228th, 229th and 230th regiments of the 38th Division. According to the plan, to the west, the 230th would make a large hook curving right to clear the Castle Peak Road and to strike at the vital point around the left flank of the Gin Drinkers Line. To the east, the 229th would cross the Tidal Cove at the Tolo Harbour heading towards the Kaitak Airport and the Devil's Peak, a major battery position, while in the centre, the 228th would strike directly at the Gin Drinkers Line. The aim of the plan was to destroy the British forces on the mainland while forcing Hong Kong to surrender with an intense bombardment. If the British continued to resist, however, then the island would have to be invaded as well. To cover this invasion force, Sakai also placed the 66th Regiment at the town of Dan Shui to protect the rear against the Chinese and to secure the conquered zones at Kowloon and the new territories. On December 1st, the Japanese plan was approved and the 23rd Army started to mobilize to prepare for the offensive operation. Five days later, some Imperial troops had already landed at Meuse Bay, and the bulk of the invading force had managed to reach Buji Town near the Shenzhen River. Early on the morning of December 8th, the Japanese invasion began with an air bombardment over the Kaitak Airport, effectively destroying most of the British aircraft. At the same time, Maltby learned of the disaster at Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war, so he ordered the troops at Kowloon to blow up all bridges and demolition points, with the objective of slowing down the Japanese advance. While the men at the Gin Drinkers Line prepared themselves for war, General Sano Tadayoshi's 38th Division crossed the river and commenced its offensive. Around the new territories, the Japanese suffered a series of ambushes by the Punjabi defenders, Yet despite the casualties, the invaders remained relentless in their advance, aided by stolen maps procured by spies on the island. By late afternoon, the Japanese had reached the village of Taipo, and a couple of hours later, the invaders took their enemy by surprise at the town of Shatin, forcing the defenders to retreat to the Gin Drinkers Line. The following day, Vice Admiral Nimi Masaichi aboard the Isuzu completed the naval blockade around the island of Hong Kong, although two British destroyers managed to escape the encirclement. At midday, Colonel Doi of the 228th was at Needle Hill doing reconnaissance when he detected a weak spot on the Gin Drinkers Line, exactly at the Xing Mun Redoubt. Despite the foggy weather and the fact that the redoubt was outside his regimental boundary, the Japanese officer didn't want to waste this great opportunity to break through the British defences, so he ordered his men to prepare for an assault. On Xing Mun, an inexperienced and undermanned company of the Royal Scots controlled five reinforced pillboxes connected by underground tunnels. In total, around 40 defenders were going to face off against 1,500 Japanese troops. Undetected, a 150-strong vanguard managed to reach two of the pillboxes by afternoon and prepared to attack at night. With grenades and gunfire, these first two pillboxes fell, albeit with some casualties for the Japanese. A counterattack by the Royal Scots was also repelled, and the defenders soon found themselves trapped at the redoubt. For some three hours, the invaders were held at bay by the Royal Scots and some Rajput reinforcements. Yet by December 10th, the remaining pillboxes were blown up with explosives and the redoubt surrendered. This was catastrophic for the British, but it was also an unpleasant surprise for the Japanese command 
as it wasn't part of the plan they had devised. After being reprimanded for insubordination, Colonel Doi started to reinforce the newly gained positions with the objective of defending themselves from the incoming British counterattacks. Meanwhile, the 230th advanced against Golden Hill, where another company of the Royal Scots was stationed. This time, however, the British managed to hold their ground with the help of Rajput reinforcement and the support of the gunboat HMS Sikala. At the same time, the 229th started to cross Tide Cove after being held up by delaying actions. The next day started with a naval invasion on Lama Island, heading to cross the Straits into Aberdeen Island and thus threatening the British position at Hong Kong. This attack was eventually driven off by long-range artillery from the Winnipeg Grenadiers, but it succeeded in diverting the efforts of the defenders, as Maltby kept the Canadian battalions on Hong Kong Island and allowed the Japanese to consolidate their position on Xing Mun. With the Gin Drinkers Line breached and the threat of an attempted naval invasion, Maltby had no other choice but to order the evacuation of the mainland forces under the cover of darkness. To the east, however, the Rajputs and their supporting artillery were to withdraw to the Mayao Tong Line, which protected the Devil's Peak Peninsula, as Maltby thought that it could be defended and supplied from the Learman Strait. Yet on the night of December 12th, the Rajputs saw their position untenable and finally decided to retreat to Hong Kong Island through the Straits. Moreover, the Japanese had already reached the southern tip of the Kowloon Peninsula and the mainland was entirely in their grasp. By the morning of December 13th, the evacuation had been completed and the defenders were already taking up their new positions on the island of Hong Kong. The defense of the mainland had lasted for only five days, but now the British were going to face the true aim of the Japanese invasion. As the colonial government refused to surrender the island, in the afternoon, the Japanese began a heavy bombardment that caused incalculable damage and even caused some defenders to desert. Spies in Hong Kong were also working day and night to destabilize the island and encourage more desertions among the Chinese population. At night on December 15th, the first Japanese assault was launched after some preparatory bombardment. The invaders, however, would be repelled by machine gun fire as they attempted to cross the harbour in improvised rafts. Despite this setback, by December 17th, the Japanese were prepared to launch their main assault on the island. Many boats had already been rounded up in preparation for the crossing. Half of the pillboxes between North Point and the Learman Straits had been destroyed, and an explosion of oil storage tanks gave perfect cover for the Japanese with a pall of dense black smoke over the area. The following day, the increase in air bombardment and the amassing of small craft at Kowloon pointed out that the Japanese assault was going to happen that very night. Their plan consisted of a two-pronged naval invasion, with the 230th and 228th embarking from the Kaitak airport towards the Taiku docks, and with the 229th stepping off from the Devil's Hill area and crossing the Liaman Straits into Saiwan. At night, the crossing commenced, with the silent embarking of the 228th heading towards the Taiku docks, while the 230th travelled to the vicinity of North Point. The Japanese were able to get halfway undetected, and after one hour, they disembarked at their destination. Not long after, the 229th arrived at Saiwan and then at Aldrich Bay completing the successful landing of the Japanese forces by midnight. The Japanese were met by the Rajput defenders, who offered fierce resistance and inflicted many casualties on the Japanese. But the invaders were vastly superior in numbers, and in consequence, the Rajput lost most of their officers and their resistance crumbled. Maltby, meanwhile, underestimated the size of the Japanese invasion and believed that the main invasion force was going to come directly at Victoria, so he decided against any counterattack and instead formed a new defensive line at Leighton Hill, composed of a platoon of the Middlesex and the Rajput remnants. Simultaneously, the 230th broke through the Rajput defenders 
only to find themselves stopped by a platoon of volunteer defense corps, the Husiliers, holed up in the North Point power station. Around 80 men, led by Major General Johnston Patterson, the chairman of the company Jardine Matheson, managed to hold down the entire Japanese regiment by themselves. Unable to dislodge the Husiliers, the Japanese decided to bombard the power station into submission. For an hour, the Husiliers resisted, inflicting several casualties on their enemy, but in the end, their ammunition was exhausted and they had to surrender. Some men, however, escaped using a broken bus as cover and continued to offer strong resistance for 18 more hours, which enabled Maltby to better assess the situation and establish a new front line to the west. At the same time, the 229th at Aldrich Bay took the Leerman fort and savagely executed its garrison. Then they encountered a platoon of the Royal Rifles of Canada and successfully managed to repel their counterattack into the fort. Proceeding southwards, the 229th came upon a camp of the Silesian missions, and there they were ordered to massacre all of the medical personnel. Concurrently, the Canadians retreated to Mount Parker, where they managed to stop the invaders' advance, with both sides suffering heavy losses. Unable to dislodge the Canadians, the Japanese flanked their position and continued in a southwestern direction, while the Canadians themselves had to withdraw further south due to their losses. But the most important operation of December 19th would happen in the center of the island. At the Wong Nei Chong Gap, the British had placed the headquarters of their defense of Hong Kong, controlling the route from north to south and from west to east. Thus, as the Japanese approached this key valley, three platoons of the Winnipeg Grenadiers were dispatched to block the Japanese advance at Jardine's lookout. After a fierce struggle, the defenders would be pushed back to some pillboxes around the area, while the 230th moved to occupy the lookout. Suffering heavy casualties, the Japanese overwhelmed the pillboxes and then continued into the gap. In response, the Winnipeg Grenadiers launched a counterattack and managed to retake Mount Butler. For 15 hours, they would defend this position against the full might of the 228th Regiment before surrendering the height and retreating westwards. Meanwhile, the 230th surrounded Wong Nei Chong and captured several key positions around it, causing great concern for the British defenders. Desperate, they attempted to escape by midday, but were cut down by machine gun fire across the gap, resulting in the fall of the center of the island. When Maltby learned about this, he prepared his forces for a massive counterattack, aimed at retaking Wong Nei Chong and Jardine's lookout, yet the operation was very badly planned and executed. As the Royal Scots arrived late to support the offensive, the Winnipeg Grenadiers attacked alone against the gap, while the Scots at Mount Nicholson were directed to assault Jardine's lookout. Both forces incredibly succeeded in getting close to their objectives in the face of a superior foe, but in the end, they were met with machine gun fire and had to retreat. By the morning of December 20th, the Japanese had consolidated their control over the center of the island and were sweeping away the last remnants of the British defenders. The Battle of Wong Nei Chon Gap would be essential for the fall of the British colony, but it would also be a costly operation for the Japanese, as they lost almost 800 men in the offensive. For the next few days, the Japanese would continue their advance across the island, while Maltby struggled to reorganize his depleted and dispersed forces. After reaching Violet Hill, elements of the 228th and 229th stumbled upon the Repulse Bay Hotel, reinforced with men from the Royal Rifles of Canada, and were held down there in a three-day siege. At the same time, the 228th moved to Shoson Hill, just north of Deepwater Bay, and defeated a company of the Punjabis before moving to Brick Hill, where they captured elements of the Middlesex and then beheaded them in cold blood. In the west, Mount Nicholson fell into Japanese hands by December 21st, and the 230th prepared to attack the new defensive line at Mount Cameron. The following day, the attack commenced, with the Punjabi defenders south of Leighton Hill being decimated and opening up a gap in the British line. 
Luckily, Rajput reinforcements coming from the north managed to hold down the invaders, while men from the Middlesex reinforced the gap to stop the Japanese advance. Simultaneously, elements of the 229th and 230th launched an attack on Stanley Mound, defended by the Royal Rifles of Canada. The Canadians repulsed the Japanese attack several times, but after their ammunition started to run low, they had to retreat further south. On December 23rd, the 228th coming from the south broke through Mount Cameron and left Leighton Hill exposed to heavy bombardment. Although the Rajput defenders managed to fall back, the Middlesex regiment was infiltrated and annihilated. With the fall of the hill, the main water supply of Victoria City was cut off, and without water, it was a matter of time before the British capitulated. On Christmas Eve, the situation looked impossible for Maltby. The Canadians were preparing a last stand at the Stanley Peninsula, and the Japanese were at the gates of the colonial capital. That same day saw the fall of St. Stephen's College and the breach of the Canadian defensive line, causing everyone in the temporary hospital to be sadistically massacred and raped. On Christmas morning, the Canadians regrouped and launched a counterattack against Stanley Village, inflicting heavy casualties on the Japanese, but in the end, they were defeated and had to retreat. At midday, on what is today known to Hong Kongers as the Black Christmas, Maltby and the British authorities saw that further resistance was futile and decided to officially surrender. For the next three days, the Japanese troops raped and pillaged while their commanders mounted a victory parade. Despite the quick victory, the Japanese were surprised that the opposition had been much stronger than anticipated, as in total they suffered around 3,000 casualties. The British, meanwhile, suffered around 4,500 losses against an enemy superior in number, with the rest of their forces, some 10,000 men, being captured and left behind in prison camps. The Japanese occupation of Hong Kong lasted for three and a half years, in which an estimated 10,000 Hong Kongers were executed, while many more were tortured, raped or maimed. The disastrous Japanese administration led to hyperinflation, food rationing, famines and the starvation of the local population, and is regarded nowadays as the darkest time in Hong Kong's history. We're planning more videos covering modern conflicts, so make sure you're subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.